Um, so I'm going to be talking about mitochondria. As Mike gave a great introduction last night as to mitochondria and their uh, history of how they were, their origins were uncovered. Uh, I'm going to be discussing a little bit more about what happens when uh, mitochondria uh, containing organisms um, live in low oxygen environments. Um, and that's uh, relevant because uh, there are a lot of eukaryotes with mitochondria living in low oxygen environments. And we all know from, uh, from uh, our uh, biology classes that uh, it's, the organelle is typically depicted as uh, using oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor for oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, so the important process to produce ATP. Um, the, uh, the thing that is not emphasized so much in, uh, in uh, sort of university is the uh, origin uh, and the evolution of the other components of the mitochondria. And it does many other biochemical things, including uh, fatty acid oxidation, some lipid synthesis, and a variety of other um, uh, processes. It's really important. Uh, role, in fact, is also in iron sulfur cluster assembly, that is the uh, assembly of iron sulfur clusters and maturation of iron sulfur proteins. And that's actually an essential function of mitochondria in yeast. You can't knock that out without making yeast inviable. So that's uh, just an overview of, the, of what we know about mitochondrial function in model systems. Um, but the picture of uh, what happens to mitochondria uh, in low oxygen uh, uh, systems was really changed forever, I guess, by the discovery of organelles called hydrogenosomes in the 70s by uh, Don Lindmark and Miklos Muller. And these organelles were found in parasitic protists uh, known as trichomonads, uh, specifically Trichomonas vaginalis is the organism that has been most well studied. And these organelles were actually uh, membrane uh, encased organelles, two membranes, and have kind of a dense matrix in TEM shown on the right. Uh, and their origins were quite mysterious. It was known that they produced ATP and eliminated molecular hydrogen, and that's where their name hydrogenosomes came from. Um, through a lot of big biochemical work initiated by Miklos Muller and, and labs that have followed in his footsteps, um, the sort of central ATP producing pathways have been understood now for hydrogenosomes, and this is what is depicted on this slide. And I've depicted things in two colors. Um, enzymes that are shown in uh, light blue, which are actually enzymes or proteins, are also found in aerobic mitochondria, typically, in model systems. Uh, and then uh, enzymes that are shown in sort of a pink color, which are the uh, characteristic hydrogenosomal anaerobic energy generating uh, enzymes, or they're part of the energy generating pathway. Just briefly to go through this, if I can, uh, maybe I'll use this, not the mouse. Um, uh, pyruvate, instead of uh, being uh, oxidatively decarboxylated by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, instead is uh, decarboxylated by an, an anaerobic enzyme known as pyruvate ferredox and oxidoreductase to acetyl-CoA. Uh, from acetyl-CoA, the CoA moieties moved over to a succinate to make succinyl-CoA by this characteristic enzyme, and then the TCA cycle enzyme th succinate thiokinase, or succinyl-CoA synthetase, produces triphosphorylated nucleotides, uh, sometimes GTP, sometimes ATP, and this is where the uh, energy production is. The electrons that are liberated in the oxidation part of this are actually uh, pass to ferredox and ultimately iron hydrogenase, the characteristic enzyme, uh, reduces protons and gives off the hydrogen gas. Um, so th that's the, just a very quick overview of the hydrogenosomal metabolism. And uh, this particular sort of biochemical module of uh, these pink enzymes uh, has turned up in a variety of different eukaryotic groups. And I'm going to be referring to it as hydrogenosomal type uh, ATP producing pathway. And now we know that uh, since the discovery of hydrogenosomes, there have been many, many studies of different distinct eukaryotes that live in low oxygen environments, most of which were, uh, that have been studied to date are parasites. But what we know from those studies is that you can broadly classify these mitochondrion-related organelles uh, into uh, five or so types. 
uh, four or five types. I seem to have four here. Um, uh, the typical, uh, yeah, so typical aerobic mitochondrion that uh, we all know and love. Um, then there are anaerobic mitochondria that are known in things like um, uh, helminths, like Ascaris uh, and Fasciola. These are mitochondria that, in fact, can, uh, under anaerobic conditions, still produce energy and use alternative electron acceptors. And then, more recently, there's been a discovery of something sort of in between aerobic mitochondria and the hydrogenosomes known as hydrogen-producing mitochondria. These are organelles that seem to have that hydrogenosomal pathway uh, to make uh, ATP, but also retain a larger number of uh, mitochondrial uh, enzymes and proteins of various sorts. And they also typically tend to encode mitochondrial DNA. A little detail I left out was that hydrogenosomes completely lack any DNA or genome. And then on the other end of the spectrum are extremely reduced mitochondrion-related organelles, uh, referred collectively as mitosomes. Often these organelles do not produce any kind of, uh, don't have any ATP generating capacity, and most often their, their well-known function is iron sulfur cluster biogenesis, that constant function that you find in virtually all uh, mitochondrion-related organelles. So that's just a quick overview of the various types that have been studied to date. But in fact, these types, these so-called classes of mitochondrion-related organelles are actually just a few um, sort of glimpses of the full spectrum of mitochondrial diversity. And I say that because most of the anaerobic protistin lineages haven't really been looked at very carefully, most of the ones that are out there. It's mostly uh, parasitic uh, protists that have been studied and that have given rise to these kind of classification schemes. So if we look at it from a phylogenetic point of view, this is a, a phylogenetic tree of eukaryotes uh, based on recent uh, phylogenomic analyses out of various people's labs, including mine. And uh, what we can do on is map on that the lineages that have these uh, mitochondrion-related organelles in color. Uh, just to emphasize how they're more exciting than normal mitochondrion-containing organisms. Uh, shown in blue are the free-living or, uh, organisms. Uh, in uh, green are commensals, ones that live in uh, animal hosts, typically. And then uh, in red are the parasites that are better studied. And I've mapped sort of roughly uh, different classifications or what is thought to uh, that the organelles found in those lineages actually are there. And of course, what we're interested in uh, broadly when it comes to mitochondrial evolution is what uh, the mitochondrion of the last eukaryotic common ancestor, Lika, looked like. Because we know from what Mike Gray said last night uh, that the mitochondrial symbiosis happened before the divergence of all extant eukaryotes. So I'm going to tell these three stories, and uh, the first story is a glimpse into what I say is the fir very first stages of uh, mitochondrial reduction, that is, loss of the, what appears to be loss of the aerobic uh, mitochondrial respiration. Um, I'm going to also then move on to two other stories, the third of which is the most controversial, and I hope I will uh, be able to do it justice. Um, so the first story I'm going to tell you is about a bug that doesn't even have a formal name. We call it DMV. It's a rhizarian, uh, that is, it's a circumonad flagellate uh, belonging to the supergroup Rhizaria. Uh, and it's called DMV because it was found in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, outside of the Department of Motor Vehicles, and nobody's gotten around to describing it yet, so we just call it DMV. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a, a circumonad flagellate. And, uh, it, the work I'm going to be describing is that of Ryan Garlick, who's a postdoc in my lab, uh, briefly uh, in Halifax. What we, when we did TEM of, of this organism, what we found, uh, it, it does live in anoxic um, or low oxygen sediments. Um, what we found was that it actually does contain organelles that seem to have one or two mitochondrial Christi-like structures within them, but they're not the typical <coughs> mitochondrial Christi-rich mitochondria. Um, when, 
we did some RNA seq and uh, some uh, Illumina sequencing of the of uh, the genome of this organism. We were able to quite quickly pick up that it had a mitochondrial genome. We we don't have a complete mitochondrial genome yet. Uh, it has subunits of complex one, uh, a very strange looking cytochrome oxidase one, and the mitoribosome uh, ribosomal RNAs. Uh, and that's, that's it so far. Um, so we, we have no evidence at all for any complex three subunits, um, such as cytochrome B, which is typically encoded on the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, when uh, Ryan then did a bioinformatic um, uh, follow-up to try and figure out every possible mitochondrial uh, transcript in the RNA-seq data, uh, by searching through mitominer and manual searching through enzymes we know from anaerobic protists as well as aerobic protists, he's got a list of about 350 candidate mitochondrial proteins. So this is actually quite a large mitochondrial proteome for uh, predicted proteome for one of these anaerobic eukaryote lineages. Typically, we've been usually only able to get up to 150 or so proteins from most of these anaerobes that we can predict confidently are uh, targeted to the organelle. Uh, amongst the interesting things we find in this organism is it has both the uh, so-called aerobic pyruvate dehydrogenase complex uh, for decarboxylating pyruvate as well as what I'm calling a hydrogenosomal type with the pyruvate ferredoxin oxidoreductase and coupled to the hydrogen production. Um, so this is the hydrogenosomal module that I discussed earlier with respect to trichomonas. It actually has multiple copies of uh, all of these various subunits, so it's uh, endowed with more than just a single copy of each. Uh, if we look into the tricarboxylic acid cycle, uh, organisms like blastocystis, an anaerobe which has a hydrogen-producing mitochondrion, typically have partial TCA cycles that are thought to run actually in reverse in a malate dismutation type pathway. Um, what we found with DMV was uh, potentially all of the enzymes of the TCA cycle, with the exception of citrate synthase, but we did find an ATP citrate lyase, which typically uh, goes in the opposite direction in the cytosol as part of fatty acid um, biosynthesis. This has a targeting peptide on it, and so we speculate at this point that maybe this is actually going in the opposite direction as a kind of citrate synthase in this organism. Obviously, complete speculation. But you can see uh, it's a more complete TCA cycle than hydrogen produ producing mitochondria typically have. If we look at what's in the electron transport chain, uh, we do have a uh, pretty full-looking complex one, complex two, and we have one subunit, cytochrome oxidase one, of uh, complex four, but no evidence at all of anything complex three. Uh, we also have an ATP synthase, so a full F1 and F0 uh, um, ATPase. This, uh, this is further made strange by the fact that the alpha subunit is actually encoded in three separate polypeptides, each of which has a targeting peptide. So it's a somewhat um, modified ATP synthase, but definitely a classical mitochondrial type. So if we were to just compare this sort of preliminary glimpse at this organism between full-blown aerobic mitochondria and the hydrogen-producing uh, mitochondria, uh, we see that uh, with pluses and minuses, we've got an organelle that seems to be just on the edge uh, between those two. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a first glimpse into how uh, mitochondrial reduction works when oxygen, um, when the organism starts to inhabit low oxygen environments and doesn't uh, do much metabolism in oxygen environments. That's our hypothesis right now. So that's our, our first story, is this uh, interesting transitional type uh, protist. The second story is just a brief vignette about uh, what I think is important um, about the process of lateral gene transfer in eukaryote evolution. Uh, and here I sort of, in a kind of hypish way, say it um, facilitates big leaps in mitochondrial evolution. I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, to tell this story, we have to go back to the eukaryote tree and come around to a very poorly known lineage called the Breviatia, um, 
so-called breviate flagellates, and an interesting organism that uh, Matt Brown in my lab uh, figured out the phylogenetic position of a few years ago called uh, Pigsuia biforma. And this is uh, this picture of this biflagellate organism and uh, a, a TEM image here. It has a mitochondrion-related organelle that you can't see very well in this picture, but uh, looks sort of like a featureless, crystalless, double membrane-bounded organelle. Through, again, RNA-seq, we did a, a in silico reconstruction of its MRO proteome, and we actually were able to predict, in this case, 122 um, putative MRO proteins. And the prediction yielded, again, uh, a kind of hydrogenosome-like uh, organelle. It has the hydrogenosomal type ATP production, but it also has quite a bit more amino acid biosynthesis pathways uh, and phospholipid biosynthesis pathways than uh, trichomonas hydrogenosomes. But the main point I want to get to about this organism, uh, pig sui, is that it's done something that virtually no other eukaryotes has, and it's actually changed how its iron sulfur cluster biogenesis system works. So just a brief overview of how iron sulfur cluster biogenesis does work in eukaryotes. Um, the ISC system is the core iron sulfur cluster biogenesis system in eukaryotes. It occurs in mitochondria. Uh, it coordinates the iron and the sulfur into these uh, iron sulfur uh, compounds. Then it actually will load them onto apoproteins to make mature proteins. And it is also known to supply some unknown factor uh, for the cytosolic CIA pathway for making uh, cytosolic and nuclear iron sulfur cluster proteins. So it's an essential uh, mitochondrial um, function, and it has nine core subunits uh, in the ISC system. There's also another iron sulfur cluster biogenesis system in eukaryotes known in plastids, the SUF system, and that's clearly cyanobacterial derived, so it's an endosymbiont derived pathway. When we looked in pigsuia, we actually, uh, for the first time, uh, in a long time, we were not able to find any of the ISC subunits at all in its RNA-seq uh, data. Uh, instead, we were able to find a pathway, a SUF pathway, but not a plastid-type SUF pathway, but one that is most similar to methanomicrobiales archaeal um, SUF uh, enzymes. So it completely lacks the nine ISC core proteins, and we have extremely deep RNA-seq data. Uh, that supports the idea that it, it really doesn't have those genes. Um, and it does express two archaeal-related SUF-CB proteins. One of these has a mitochondrial targeting peptide, and we showed by immunofluorescence functions within the mitochondrion-related organelles. One is apparently cytosolic and can be shown to actually localize to the cytosol. What's interesting about this SUF pathway is its phylogenetic affinity. So this is a broad phylogenetic tree of SUF uh, in the region of the tree where our pigsuia homologs branch. And they're shown in purple here. And what I'm meaning to show by this is the various type of uh, bacterial and archaeal groups that possess uh, closely related homologs of SUF-CB that is found in pigsuia. They're all uh, typically encoded in this small, reduced SUF system, unlike E. coli, which has a much larger SUF system with six subunits. This one only has two, and it's in an operon, whereas in the eukaryotes, uh, that operon seems to be fused into a bipartite peptide. Uh, if we zoom in on the part of the tree where pigsuia branches, you can see the two cytosolic and um, MRO homologs form a clade, so that, that seems to be a gene duplication that happened that allowed the specialization between cytosol and mitochondrial-related organelle. And these are related to a number of other anaerobic protist uh, lineages, and those are very strongly clustered with a subgroup uh, of the, the archaea known as the methanomicrobiales. Okay. So this seems to be a very clear case of uh, lateral gene transfer from the methanomicrobiales-like uh, archaea to uh, an anaerobic protist lineage, and then probably we 
suggest a subsequent eukaryote to eukaryote lateral gene transfer events. So that's story number two. Uh, and oh, so wh why is this a great leap? So I, I think the main point here is that you cannot lose iron sulfur cluster biogenesis in eukaryotes uh, unless you replace it with something else. Uh, so the ISC system that is in all eukaryote mitochondria has only been uh, lost twice, and in both cases it looks like lateral gene transfer of a different kind of iron sulfur system, uh, in this case SUF, has allowed the loss of the more complex ISC system. And then finally, uh, the most controversial part uh, is this origins of uh, this anaerobic hydrogenosomal type ATP generation. And I don't want to do this in a way that makes people pissed off, and Bill in particular. Um, I, I just want to do this in a way that brings up the issue of how do you, I mean, because it gets to be a philosophical question of how do you actually decide uh, what the origins of a system is when you've got multiple different mechanisms that can generate the observations. So here we are back to our hydrogenosomal system, and yeah, this isn't good. Um, <laughs> The question basically is, was this system part of the mitochondrial symbiont system? Was that mitochondrial symbiont a facultative anaerobe, and did it bring the hydrogenosomal system in with it? Um, or, and there's been several alternatives suggested, one is that instead uh, those enzymes of anaerobic metabolism have been recently acquired by the various anaerobic eukaryote lineages by lateral gene transfer and passed around to each other by lateral gene transfer. And then there's a third alternative that hasn't been discussed very much, but it's possible that, in fact, uh, those enzymes were in Lika, in the last common ancestor, in their organelle or in the cytosol, but their origin was not the mitochondrion, that lateral gene transfer occurred in a pre lika organism. Uh, and so those are three possibilities. Um, yeah, this is not going to work very well. Is there evidence that uh, the hydrogenosomal type uh, ATP generating enzymes were in Lika? And I think the answer here is uh, possibly, and I'll show you why. And shown here on the tree is mapped in yellow the, the lineages that do contain these enzymes. Now, it's shown throughout the eukaryote tree, and there's vast numbers of organisms not shown in these wedges that don't contain them. But at least from this distribution, it's plausible that the ancestor could have had them. Um, the question of where mitochondria come from is something that Siv will address. But what I want to say, basically, is that there's no strong evidence from phylogenetics that places mitochondria as a sister group to any known uh, facultatively anaerobic um, alpha proteobacterial lineage. And that's phylogenomic evidence, at least. There could be other forms of evidence that don't say that. Um, this hydrogenosomal type of metabolism is extremely rare in alpha proteobacteria. Here are all the genomes of different alpha proteobacteria, and these are the, the genomes that actually contain these various enzymes. Very few of them uh, contain all of the enzymes required for this hydrogenosomal metabolism. So it doesn't look like an ancient feature of alpha proteobacteria. And if we look at the phylogenies of these enzymes, we don't see a consistent signal of eukaryotes allied with alpha proteobacteria. So eukaryotes are shown in green, alpha proteobacteria are shown in pink. They don't tend to ever cluster together. And uh, there are also cases of eukaryote to eukaryote LGT within these phylogenies that are very clear, in this case, between diplomonads and the uh, entamoeba. So I'm going to whip through this and just say, summarize the evidence for the phylogeny that there does seem to be a case to be made that eukaryotes can be monophyletic in, these, um, in many of these enzymes and could, in fact, go back to Lika. In some, for some of these enzymes, there's clearly more than one origin within eukaryotes, it seems, from the phylogeny. But in no case is there any affinity to alpha proteobacteria. So the question really is, um, what does that mean? And I, I'll just skip to what I think it means. Um, it's possible that at least parts of this system was in Lika, okay? It's just not very clear because the phylogenies are poorly resolved. Uh, and it's clear that some of these enzymes have been recently transferred between eukaryotes. So we know that mechanism has operated 
at least uh, in more recent times in eukaryote evolution. And so in the absence of an alpha proteobacterial affinity for the enzymes, I don't see a strong reason to suppose it came in with the mitochondrial symbiont, at least on these phylogenetic grounds. So uh, that's my opinion, and I'm sure it won't be uh, uh, universally agreed upon, but that's part of the idea here is to stimulate discussion. So really, the ancestral mitochondrion could have had both aerobic and anaerobic, or it could have been aerobic only, and it's really hard to know which way the first <coughs> steps of uh, mitochondrial evolution went. So I'll just uh, leave it at that, and I'm sorry for going over time. <laughs>